1775, Thomas Paine wrote a pamphlet stating that the freedoms of man can only be maintained by limiting the power of government. The pamphlet was called Common Sense. In 2015, it still is Common Sense. I'm Mark Zakaria. And I'm Allison Perry. This is Common Sense. Welcome back. As of today, Rhode Island is about three weeks and two major holidays away from the start of the next legislative session. Forces in both the House and Senate are beginning to align on issues which should be of critical interest to everyone here in the Ocean State. You can depend on Common Sense TV to analyze it all for you in depth and on point. This week, our show features another interview by State Representative Patricia Morgan. This week, she talks with Bob Cusack, a public financial expert. They will discuss the Fiscal Stability Act and how it will affect the Providence as it gets closer to financial disaster. Commentator Jeff Richard will conclude the broadcast with insight into the future of Nigeria. In between segments, Mark and I will drop back in once or twice to post the satirical question, are you kidding me? To get all that started, we will first take an analytical look at some of the top news stories affecting you right now. Mark? Thanks, Allison. Governor Raimondo's plan to toll Rhode Island's major throughways as a means of gathering extra revenue to cover a $1.3 billion bond scheme is back in the news this week. It will likely remain a hot topic in the headlines for some time to come. You could imagine that such a complex plan as the one apparently proposed by the administration would have required a considerable amount of stakeholder input during its development. Sadly, that now seems not to have been the case. Last week, the president of the Rhode Island Trucking Association, Christopher Maxwell, announced that he'd filed a far-reaching Freedom of Information request to get the release of documents pertaining to how the governor's plan was actually framed. In a prepared statement, Maxwell indicated he'd made numerous informal requests of the administration in an attempt to make a positive contribution to the planning process on behalf of his members. He sought such details as the proposed locations of the 17 to 22 toll gantries to be erected to collect this new state income. He also wanted to see the state estimates of the average daily traffic by tolled vehicles past each of these locations. In essence, Mr. Maxwell and the association felt they were in a uniquely qualified position to offer accurate double checks on the governor's numbers. The Trucking Association was clearly frustrated by the administration's resistance to include them in the development of this complex plan. I say that because directly after the release of the statement of their FOIA request, Chris Maxwell went on a tour of the radio talk shows to emphasize his organization's concerns. In his interviews, he hearkened back to the inflated estimates of the traffic volume, which had been the basis of the projections used by the state during the Sakonet River Bridge toll debate, he also inferred from Governor Raimondo's general comments that she expected through trucking at a rate of more than twice what it is today. And that was before any correction for long-haul truckers who would definitely avoid Rhode Island altogether if they could, as Maxwell pointed out on the air. Folks, this is all part of the mounting evidence that the Raimondo administration's bias towards secrecy is intended to prevent any objective analysis of the probable outcome of the big bond before the thing is a done deal. So much for transparency in government. So much for government working for the good of the citizens. Sadly, it also appears to mean so much for any serious consideration of the Republican No Toll Bridge Works plan. Something tells me that all Rhode Islanders will someday have to pay for that hubris. Allison? Thank you, Mark. Recently, Prime Minister of India, Narendra Mondi, spoke words that have never been more important to understand, but not for the reason you may think. Justice demands that with what little carbon we can still safely burn, developing countries are allowed to grow. The lifestyles of a few must not crowd out opportunities for the many still on the first steps of the development ladder. The treaty proposed recently at the Climate Summit, held in Paris, is poorly put together. The treaty gives unfair advantages to some underdeveloped eastern countries as opposed to countries in the West. There are currently global climate pacts being negotiated at the climate summit with one goal in mind, which is to distribute wealth globally. Some parts of the pact aim to stunt the economic growth of the West while increasing the cost of business, while supposedly still developing economies of China and India are given advantages over the West. Seriously, China is still a developing economy? China is currently one of the more wealthy nations and leads the world in math and engineering. 
What we witnessed at the Paris Conference on Climate Change was an overt effort to redistribute wealth. We also saw it try to use the United Nations as cover for short-circuiting the sovereignty of individual nations, principally our own. Folks, this approach is nothing but trouble. The science behind Prime Minister Mondi's assertion is open to debate. The political process the Paris Conference attempted to launch is anathema to individual initiative and economic growth worldwide. Happily, the final agreement has no more chance of actually being implemented than did the Kyoto Protocols a decade ago. But that won't stop the forces of socialism from trying again, probably someday soon. Back to you, Mark. Thanks, Allison. Here's one to file under the heading, boring, but critically important. Last week in Go Local Prov, resident financial guru Mike Riley compared the pension management styles of three men, each of whom control the post-employment benefits of thousands of present and former employees. The men in Riley's analysis were perennial rich guy Warren Buffett, legendary fund manager Jack Bogle, and newly elected Providence Mayor Jorge Elorza. To put it simply, Mike Riley focused on one factor in each of the gentlemen's pension calculations, the estimated annual growth rate of existing funds in their investment portfolios. In a vacuum, this number would represent the guesstimate each was making on expected growth in the 12-month period ahead. Nothing happens in a vacuum, however, so you should also factor in what kind of growth they need in order to cover expected liabilities. That's called the discount rate. The two professional money men estimated the growth of their expertly managed portfolios at either 5% or 6.7%. Buffett, with the higher of those two estimates, had the luxury of using a much more conservative discount rate for his calculations, with which he could still cover projected payouts his pension fund would have to make. For Mira Lorza's politically managed portfolio to just break even, he needed to use a discount rate of some 8.25%. According to Jack Bogle, as referenced in Mike Riley's article, 5% growth is the absolute maximum rate any expert portfolio manager could expect to see in this climate. The lower the return on existing principal, however, the higher the actuarially required contribution or ARC payment has to be in order to increase the fund to a level where it can cover all of its bills. Okay, how do you think the Providence Pension Fund stacks up to those of the two old pros? <laughs> According to Mike Riley's calculation, that ARC or makeup payment in the capital city would have to equal $140 million in 2016 or 42% of all tax revenues coming into the city coffers. Like that's going to happen. So what we are looking at here, folks, I'd say that's nothing less than the full-on meltdown in the city's ability to make the post-employment payments to which it is committed. Can you say Central Falls on steroids? And the worst thing about it is that everyone except Mike Riley and me is out there making believe it ain't so. Hey, hey, there is an adult approach. Allison? Thank you, Mark. Now it's time to get into the first segment of Representative Patricia Morgan's interview. Before we do, though, Mark and I will flip a coin to see which one of us interjects the satirical, satirical question. Are you kidding me? The Property Rights Alliance of Rhode Island, Prairie for short, thinks Governor Raimondo is nudging the state legislature towards enacting a number of new taxes for use by cities and towns to pay for new, otherwise unfunded, state mandates. Are you kidding me? Actually, Prairie is deadly serious. In a press release last week, the organization cited the governor's executive order number 15-06, issued last February. Its title is Strengthening Municipalities for Future Growth and Success. Sounds okay. The order charges the Office of Lieutenant Governor with responsibility for developing and promulgating a number of new initiatives. A special concern to the property rights group is item 7, which reads... Office of Lieutenant Governor shall explore opportunities to enable municipalities to diversify their sources of revenue beyond property taxes and motor vehicle excise tax. By diversified sources of revenue, I don't think the governor meant to authorize bake sales or municipal car wash events. 
Prairie thinks this is a prelude to General Assembly approval of a range of supplemental taxes which cities and towns could use to further exploit their tax bases. The assumption seems to be that new supplemental taxes will be assessed as a percentage of the locality's existing property tax rate. In other words, if Prairie is right, the municipality could enact a supplemental tax program that did not require specificity as to amounts since it would be an arithmetic factor of the existing per thousand property tax rate. If that's the case, then the state is making initial moves to assuage its own guilt over a planned stream of big government initiatives it means to require, but not fund. Maybe state legislators can sleep soundly at night since they'll have exported the dirty work of extracting all this additional shkarol from the citizens. City and town councilors, however, will have to pass these supplemental taxes in the dead of night to avoid having to face their constituents directly as they do. Is it just me, or are we about to get run over by the big government bandwagon again? Are you kidding me? Welcome to Common Sense, Rhode Island. This is a program where we try to make sense out of the policies that affect your life and come up with common sense solutions. Um, I'm Representative Patricia Morgan, and today we have with us Bob Cusick, who is a portfolio manager with Whale Rock Point Partners. Got it. Um, and before we start talking, I'd like to know, I'd like the, the, the viewers to understand why you have the credentials to talk about this. You've been, you've been in this business for a long time. Yes, thanks for that reminder, Pat. <laughs> I, I started in 1977, as a, as a, as a matter of fact. Um, I started in public finance in New York City uh, at a large investment banking company uh, where we underwrote um, securities to allow borrowings by states, municipalities, and agencies. And after that, uh, I migrated over to the buy side uh, from selling bonds and underwriting them for those borrowers to buying them on the behalf of, uh, of, of clients, of, of investors. And I was an advisor to uh, a single state municipal bond fund that earned a five-star Morningstar rating. So I have a background at trying to evaluate the credit quality of individual uh, borrowers and, uh, and, the, and the prices of the bonds and all. Uh, and then since then, I've advised uh, private clients and institutions on uh, investment policy and on uh, individual portfolios uh, and all of that. So over time, I've had experience in finances. I've also been appointed by a couple of the governors here to uh, several of the state agencies with, pub with public finance responsibilities. Yes, you've come up to the State House a lot and testified and given us really good advice. Well, thank you. Given uh, us a lot of knowledge. And even in, as you've served, um, I got into public service a little bit more by running for public office, and I was elected to the city council in, a couple of times in East Providence, and I was assistant mayor there. And so uh, then I was trying to balance the interests of the taxpayers with those of the employees, and uh, which isn't easy. But in any case, so I've seen all of these problems from different... You've seen it from all sides. Different sides, yes. Okay, so... There's been a lot of talk um, over the last couple of months about Providence. It's in trouble, right? We know it's in trouble. Uh, the new mayor, Alorza, is saying it's in trouble. Even when Mayor Tavares was in, it was clear that their pension obligations were swallowing up huge parts of the, the, the city's budget, and their unfunded liabilities are enormous. Did I did I encapsulate that pretty well? Yeah, it, 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 you've you've painted a very bleak picture, and it isn't even complete yet. <laughs> you know, because yeah. there are several elements you've left out. Uh, there's a lawsuit that uh, the the mayor, uh, in trying to save money, changed the schedule of firefighters, which other communities have tried to do or have successfully done. But because of a particular legal aspect of it, he's vulnerable to losing a lawsuit, which would be. It, as much the penalty could be as much as you know 19 million so even if there's only a deficit now of a couple of million which it may be more uh, that a loss in that lawsuit would make the operating budget it, all but unworkable so because see the backdrop is like so many places in, in in Rhode Island there's not much taxing capacity left 
Yeah, no, I, uh, Providence, my understanding is Providence has the second highest corporate tax in the country. That's, that's killing economic development. Economic development jobs, right? Um, as a company, you're not going to go to come to Providence because, one, it's in Rhode Island, which has high regulatory environment, a lot of high electricity rates, all those things. But then you layer on that really high corporate tax rate. Unless you get some kind of payment or tax stabilization agreement, which means you don't have to pay taxes, you're not coming. It's a and you're not bringing jobs with you. It's a beautiful place, but it's costly to do business there. Well, and you, and it, they can't grow their tax base. Right? That's the issue. They can't grow their tax base. Well, in the 1940s it was different, but today really mo so many companies can locate anywhere. They don't have to be in a central city core uh, because technology is so important now. So people can, they're distributed, they can be anywhere. And, and so there's no, there's, there's no compulsion, so you have to attract. And uh, they're not doing a, jo a good job of doing that. Now, at the same time, the governor's centerpiece of the governor's economic uh, development program is the redevelopment of the 195 land. Yeah. And there's some progress on that, and that's really important. But unfortunately, the backdrop of the Providence's finances uh, is a major negative. Major so, negative. So you've got sure. a lot of problems. The, the unfunded pension liability is huge. And then, of course, you know, as we talked about, the, this, this on an operating uh, basis, you know, this looming liability. Yeah, uh, I mean, even with you, when you have a tax stabilization agreement, which most of these companies will have, they still have to worry about an impending bankruptcy and the fallout from that, because um, something's going to happen. And until you, that uncertainty is removed, a company is kind of, well, it let's wait and see, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty. Companies now, don't like to deal with uncertainty. It's to be avoided. And it's right, to be avoided. And, and, and right now, uh, you know, we have the great good fortune of, of having GE, a major industrial company, one of the Fortune 500, one of, uh, just a, a leader in uh, American business, uh, considering Rhode Island as its corporate headquarters. And the, the Hartford Current is reporting this as very, very serious. So we well, hope and that's, it is. And let's just say, though, that's because in Connecticut, the taxes have become too onerous mm -hmm. for them. Right, they kind of taxed that wonderful company out of Connecticut. Um, they feel very vulnerable. It's a word of warning to us here in Rhode Island, right? Um, if you really want companies to come and bring their jobs, you've got to. Hmm. Everything has to work together to keep to keep it reasonable. We have a great opportunity because of what was it ten years ago, Jack Welch? The famous CEO of that company said that Rhode Island, he said some terrible things about Rhode Island. Yeah. So now if the current CEO thinks we're in pretty good shape, uh, well enough to be attracted here, that would be great. Unfortunately, uh, you have the capital city in dire straits and distress. Dire straits. Now, I think that really what could be, if, obviously no one wants a municipal bankruptcy, but in Rhode Island, if the, a municipal bankruptcy is not a default on its debts, that's that was what why that question was great about the first lien, the law that we have here, the Fiscal Stability Act. So that's very important. So well, we could, we could, we that could was a survive it. That was a conversation we had off camera, so let's tell the folks about that. In 2010, maybe, a law was passed, I think it was before, it was before I got in, a law was passed through the State House that said that bondholders would be paid first, mm -hmm. so that uh, it protected our bond rating here in Rhode Island, which is important. We want to be able to borrow money at good rates. We have to protect our bond ratings. But what is the effect of that on citizens well, and workers? Central, Central Falls went, uh, entered Chapter 9 bankruptcy, federal bankruptcy. Uh, the bondholders were paid timely. There wasn't any interruption in that. So it was not a default. And th though there was there was a lot of sacrifice on the part of the of the employees and retirees, uh, you had a strong receiver, and they brought the expenses down to meet the revenues. And well, the the taxpayers paid a, an immediate twenty percent increase in their did. taxes, and they had had them increased previously. Right. So they sacrificed too. They sacrificed too. So there was a lot more taxes as well as cuts for the employees. But after it? Really painful. After it, you had rating upgrades and you had fit, real stability, which is what you have now. And what we need to find all over Rhode Island. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Okay. And we'll be right back. We all know that it's been in the news lately. The refugee crisis. That's all we've been hearing about. And, but I'm about to give you some cold hard truth that you probably haven't heard yet from the mainstream media outlets. Over the next year, President Obama plans to let in up to 10,000 refugees, of which up to 30% are estimated to have ties to terrorism. Yet, we have over 600,000 homeless Americans on our streets. Are you kidding me? We can't take care of and employ our own citizens. Lines for welfare and programs like WIX are already oversubscribed. People are living off of government assistance. Violence is just about every state and in record numbers. Yet you mean to tell me we're going to admit over 10,000 people, some of which could potentially be violent, all for the sake of good diplomacy? Please, there are plenty of prosperous countries, some that are faring better economically than we are, might I add. Could these nations help out with Syrian refugees? There are countries in the Middle East that are currently peaceful and prosperous that could take these people in. And guess what? If these refugees were to flee to a Middle Eastern country, they wouldn't have to assimilate to a culture that is wildly different from their own. For Americans, this refugee crisis sounds a lot more like an excuse for our government to let more terrorism onto our soil, wittingly or unwittingly. As always, I ask the question, are you kidding me? Welcome back. Today we're talking with Bob Cusack, who is um, a portfolio manager for Whale Rock Point Partners. And we're talking about public finance and more specifically about the issues, the problems that Providence is having. I mean, it's been in the paper, so I don't, I don't think anybody's gonna, th gonna um, think that this is a news flash. Providence is struggling with its pension obligations, with its operating budget. It can't even kind of pay, pay for the day-to-day. -day. Um, and it's a real struggle now. They have um, a lawsuit filed by the firefighters that has a huge liability attached to it. What's, what's, part of the, what's part of the solution here? Well, it's so difficult. If it were easy, you know, someone would have already done it. Um, so much of this is a long time in the making. Promises have been made to employees. I mean, most of the city and town budgets are 87% or so uh, employment costs. That's where most of our money goes, one way or another employment costs, including the pension obligations. Sure. So you really, you know, yeah, when, into paychecks, when you, when you, protected by contracts. And contracts entered into by elected officials. And so, uh, and they're supported, of course, for reelection by the bargaining units often, you know, city employees one way or another. And so there's that conflict. And over time, the amount of salaries, benefits, and all the rest have, have grown really so large that it's hard for taxes to keep up with it, unless there's great economic development, that, which is a tide that lifts everyone. That hasn't happened. It's really been the opposite here. Yeah, I mean, we, I kind of, I, I used to work downtown, um, and it used to be bustling. Mm -hmm. um, it really was. There were people on the sidewalks all the time. Um, and, and when I finally, finally left uh, Providence to, to work outside of the city, by then it was no longer bustling, right? If you go down in that financial area, um, well, we know that the industrial bank building is empty now, but not just that is empty. There's a lot of offices down there that are empty that used to be full of employees. Um, and, and a lot of that, I think, was because the rents became unsustainable. So, I mean, I think the, 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 our viewers can understand if you're an apartment, if, if you rent an apartment, you're paying taxes inside your rent. And that, that's part of it. So when the taxes go up, your rent goes up. Well, I think it was the same for, for business folks down there. And wrote, our, our capital city has kind of emptied in a lot of ways, um, as, as companies have found cheaper rents outside of the city. There are some good, uh, there is some good news there. There is some vitality, there's a thriving arts community, and there's, there's a lot of really good stories. There are also some, <clears throat> some good uh, residential redevelopment downtown. There's some good uh, there. There's some good, but it, 
but but it's, it's not a thriving city. No, no, it's not. And a lot of things have to happen before it does. And the, and the, the 195 redevelopment could be a very a big bright Absolutely. spot. Absolutely. However, the city's finances are in absolute disarray and stress. And the Fiscal Stability Act, which we have in Rhode Island, which not only provides for uh, bondholders being paid first, so they preserve access to the credit markets and bondholders will <clears throat> be always paid, there's be no defaults, that's great. but. <clears throat> but beyond that, the Fiscal Stability Act requires state intervention in distressed communities. So Providence is no exception. So the state will intervene as this gets worse. And then what will that look like? I, I hope that the city understands, that, that the elected officials understand that if a budget commission is appointed, which is one of the, it's only the second step in, right. if that's appointed, there'll be no need for city council meetings. There'll yes. be no need for the mayor to come to work. Yeah, uh, because the, the budget commission will have all authority. That's It'll right. supplant entirely the elected officials, which is it's to be avoided, but it can't be avoided if the distress is such that it can't. So that's the next move here. And, and obviously, it, people have to come together. But the key that I think people don't understand is that the bondholders, the, the people who lent the money, they're going to be paid. They're going to be paid. So when, when you hit the wall, that means the taxpayers and or the city employees are going to have to make the sacrifices. Unfortunately, in Providence, there's not much capacity. The taxpayers really have very little capacity to pay more. So, and if it gets to the point where a Chapter 9 filing happens, bankruptcy, doesn't mean default, but bankruptcy, it's a central fall situation where, where a strong receiver is appointed and then the, the, the expenses are brought down unilaterally. Contracts are torn up, thrown away, and the, the city pays what it can afford to not only current employees, but to the, the retirees. retirees. as well, and I think um, our viewers are probably aware of what happened in Central Falls. Now, Central Falls went through bankruptcy before the Fiscal Stability Act was in place, so it went directly to Chapter 9. Um, but, but in that case, um, the retirees lost better than 50% of their pensions. I believe it was 55% of their pensions. Taxpayers paid an, an immediate tax rate increase, then another 20% was added. So the taxpayers paid a whole lot more and the, and, and the employees and retirees paid a whole lot more as well. <clears throat> so it was painful. But the pain happened after many, many years of mismanagement. Yeah. And now the, the city is right, is righted from, and, and is stable from a financial standpoint. Well, it, it seems, yeah, it seems to be on the mend very quickly. I mean, that happened... 13 months it took. It Relatively happened in short 2010. Period of short period of time. And they're already, uh, yeah, they're, they're on the mend. They're much doing okay. Off. Yeah, much they're better. much better off. Uh, Providence is bigger. I think Central Falls is our smallest city, and now we have our biggest city that we're talking about. And I know that there has been some talk about pension obligation bonds. We know that Woonsocket put out a pension obligation bond to deal with their uh, pension liabilities. Um, you know, I'm a financial advisor too, and I always tell my clients, you don't put anything in the stock market that you can't afford to lose. Woonsocket put their, their pension obligation bond out in 2007, I think, so just before the, the what do we call that, the crash? The crisis. <laughs> the, the crisis. The financial crisis. The financial crisis. So it didn't work out for them. What do you think about pension obligation bonds? Could have worked bonds? out for them had they, had they not panicked as a board <clears throat> at, the, uh, at the bottom of the market, sold all, the, all their stocks, and then never got back in, uh, which is one of the problems that happens when you panic. Uh, so th they didn't serve the public very well. So that whole thing has been a mess. <clears throat> but pension obligation bonds have succeeded in some places. It's not a good idea. It's very risky right now, particularly really because risky. you'd be borrowing at taxable rates to buy basically investments, whether they be stocks, bonds, alternatives. Yeah, those. and you can never you can never guarantee what happens in the stock market. But you guarantee that you owe the debt back. So that's the problem. You're, you're, it's risky. Not a good solution at this point. Um, the other thing that I, I see with the pension obligation bonds is 
you know, if, if somebody uses margin, which is like borrowing and putting it in the stock market, um, they're not taking money constantly from that fund. So it, a pension is always paying out money. Right. Every month it's paying out money. So it always needs to have money available to come out, right? It's not just you put it in, well, if the market goes down, you can wait until it comes back up because sometimes you can't. There's always money coming out of the pension. Um, it, it's, 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 you don't have that luxury of waiting until the market recovers or even, waiting until you get your investment back. Right, that, that's right. But even with a pension bond, you would be contributing still. But it, the problem is that you would owe an amount of money that may be greater than what you're earning. That's the problem. Okay. And with that, we'll be right back. It has been said that anyone who believes big government is the answer has never tried to audit big government. Just last week, that axiom was proven again by an inspector general from big government itself. Are you kidding me? Whoa, the truth about HUD from HUD itself? That's what happened. The Office of Inspector General of the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, claimed it could not do its job of auditing the agency because the books were so lax as to be unauditable. The IG publicly announced that HUD's financial statements and systems are missing records, they are inaccurate, and sometimes even violated federal laws. Bear in mind, folks, that included among HUD programs with useless financial accounting records is nearly $20 billion at the Government National Mortgage Association, or Ginny May. I really have to read some of these assertions verbatim. Quote, this audit report contains nine material weaknesses, eight significant deficiencies in internal controls, and six instances of noncompliance with applicable laws and regulations. These weaknesses were due to an inability to establish a compliant control environment, implement adequate financial accounting systems, retain key financial management staff, and identify appropriate accounting principles." Unquote. To this smackdown, senior HUD managers simply replied that they were aware that some weaknesses may exist in their accounting processes, but had not had the time or resources to confirm the IG's report. Huh? So being big government is never having to say you're sorry? Is it the condition wherein you may promulgate regulations to your heart's content without ever having to comply with any of them yourself? Does the excuse that it's all grown so complex and wearisome absolve civil servants of any obligation, including that they have to the taxpayers who cover their larger than average paychecks? More to the point might be this final question. What are you and I doing not only putting up with this incompetence, but continuing to fund it. Are you kidding me? Hi, I'm Representative Patricia Morgan. The Republican No Tolls Bridge Works plan fixes our deficient bridges using existing sources of revenue. That's money we already take from you taxpayers. One of the areas that we chose to take money from was the Convention Center Authority. And that's misleading because actually we subsidize the Convention Center Authority every year with between 20 and 25 million dollars. Our study showed that they're a very inefficient organization and they could do better. So we're actually making them accountable to take one and a half million dollars less from the taxpayers in 2016, and that will increase a little bit over the 10 years. We think they can and should do better for, for Rhode Islanders. It's a much better use of our resources and much better for the state if they improve and actually become profitable or at least less costly. Okay, welcome back uh, to Common Sense. Uh, today we're talking with Bob Kuzak, who is a portfolio manager with Well Rock Point Partners and we're talking about public finance and more specifically about Providence and its, its really severe financial crisis. I think it's in a financial crisis. Could we call it that right now? It's, I think so. Yeah. Um, the mayor has said that they, he, he's, he's trying to find savings, getting a lot of pushback on finding those savings. 
Um, but if he doesn't, and if they can't balance the budget, I think they're in a deficit right now, right? Projected to be so, and then there's this, as we mentioned in an earlier segment, the, this litigation that if they lose could be another $19 million problem they'd have to solve in short order, which would be almost impossible for them. Almost impossible, and, and it's impossible because right now they are a highly taxed community. There's just uh, the capacity of people to pay after a while. Um, and I think they've reached it. Certainly the property tax uh, you know, for homeowners in Providence is very, very high. Very high, yeah. I mean, and it's some of the, some of the lowest incomes in the state are in Providence. Yeah. Huge, huge areas, huge neighborhoods where we have our most vulnerable citizens. And when you raise those property taxes uh, and some of those, uh, that housing, then rents have to go up. Yeah. How's that going to happen? It's so I, th I think we as public officials have to keep them in mind. This is about keeping people in homes, in apartments that they can afford, right? right? That they're not strained trying to keep a hold of, mm. of their, their, their family living space. But also, when you raise all those ta property taxes so high, you're squeezing jobs out. Now, a lot of those poor... They don't have cars. They don't have a easy access where they can drive anywhere they want to go. So they need the jobs right there in the community. And what we've done with this, these high tax rates is we've squeezed their employment out. We've kind of eliminated that, those first couple of rungs on the ladder, right, to economic um, stability for them. So it's really important that Providence get a handle on this. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You're, 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 it stresses everything, and, and the, the taxes are excessive now. So there's no more capacity in that right. direction. Right. And if they can't grow their tax, tax base by developing the 195 land or attracting companies into Providence, and who would come when you have such a high property well, even tax if you, rate? Even if you can, it's, it's hard to do it fast enough. Well, and I noticed that every time they, you know, they talk about building something in Providence, it's we need a tax stabilization agreement. What's tax stabilization agreement say to you? It's just a break. It's a tax break for a while. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes they stay in place for almost for forever. Uh, but well, but it's, 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 you know, those can be used creatively to encourage uh, risk taking and in the community. That, that's okay. It's not like they're terrible. The problem is the, the the, the city's budget is just in, it's in disarray. There, there's not enough revenue for the expenses, and the expenses have grown gargantuan over the years. Look, if these are elected officials that make promises and enter into collective bargaining agreements that they don't, they don't parse out, they don't analyze, they don't yeah. know the true costs of. So time passes, but I'll tell you one thing. It I've doesn't been seem this. bad, but then the, the, the effect the, of it. I've been yeah. through this routine, and let me tell you how it does work. The other side, meaning the employee side, through their, uh, their public employee unions, they know exactly how much it will cost over time. Why? They have to know because th they're asked for concessions, so they have to know the value of what they get in order to know whether the value of a, a concession is, is worth it. So they know better than the employer side, better than the taxpayer side, better than the, the city side. And this goes on all the time where there's an asymmetry, there's an unequal uh, power and knowledge uh, and this goes on, and this is well documented. But over time, what's happened? Promises have been made, contracts have been entered into, they become more and more expensive than ever the city ever understood. And now, oh, they become unaffordable. And borrowing doesn't work, so I mean, they're already at a point where they can't. Uh, one good thing is the, the, the bondholders are all, they're protected right now, they're yeah. protected. So if we hit a wall and there has to be intervention and then later, maybe um, a, even a Chapter 9 filing like Central Falls happened, uh, like happened there. Uh, it, it, what will happen is, the, the, because there's very little capacity left, the, it's going to fall hard on the employees, the current employees and the retirees, as it did, as, as we talked about, over 50% haircuts to, to retirees' pensions. That was a terrible result, but it happened. So we don't, nobody wants that to happen. To avoid that, probably the best solution is to come together ahead of that. You know, if indeed this is the process and chapter nine would be dire and these are the consequences, we see, we know what has happened in previously with Central Falls, 
why not come together and solve this? And it means concessions, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, and, and either the concessions are negotiated and agreed on ahead of time, mm -hmm. or they come with a hard hammer down yeah. the road, right. and that's the truth. I mean, you look at Central Falls, and again, I mean, I do not believe that the, the folks in Providence could sustain a 20% tax increase at this point. Their taxes are already high. Their rents, you read all the time that the rents are so high. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I, I think it's like $22,000 a year is, is the average household income in Providence. Clearly, there are areas that, that make more, but there are a lot of poor folks in there that have to have housing. 20% more on their housing would be, a, would be a deal breaker. So their capacity to pay higher taxes is gone. It's already stressed. It's already been squeezed it's out the of limit. them. It's at it's the at limit. It's at the limit. So, so then what you're saying is the employees and the retirees are the ones who either by picking and choosing now and figuring it out now with Mayor Alorza and the council or ending up with a budget commission or in chapter nine, it's gonna happen and so, that's where the hammer is gonna fall. It's important for everyone to understand that it won't be Mayor Alorza or any of the city council. They will be disempowered early in the process. The taxpayer yeah. and their representatives are taken out of the equation. And then ultimately there'll be this czar appointed which will be all powerful with the supervision of the court who is the receiver. And in the case of Central Falls, that was he was very decisive and even though the taxpayers made sacrifices, the employees made grave sacrifices and it's to be avoided it is to be avoided and yet I look at their unfunded pension liabilities um, obviously current employee costs contribute to that but it's all of this legacy costs we call them legacy costs are are clearly putting the strain on the budget too yeah. and it's just it's such a sticky problem. Well, that's all based on, as, as the governor said when she was treasurer, it's the math of it, okay, the mathematics, the arithmetic. And it's all based on the assumptions. So if the retirement age were changed, you know, and raised, okay. that would change the assumptions and it would make that money go farther. And, you know, so there could be adjustments made to the benefit side, to the liability. A pension fund is assets and liabilities. Assets is the investments in the fund <clears throat> and the liabilities are the rules by which payments are made out okay and those liabilities they could be adjusted and that's what happened of course you know with the state reform and it could it, it must happen in many of these municipalities okay well um a lot to be thinking about um and while um we're going to think about it while you see uh, are you kidding me segment Not too long ago, there was a shooting in San Bernardino, California. There were 14 slaughtered, not including both of the shooters, who are now also dead. Folks, this is getting insane. It seems as though every other week there is some type of mass casualty, whether it is heavily publicized or not. Are you kidding me? My fellow Rhode Islanders, we as a nation have the highest number of guns per person in the entire world. This isn't a bad thing. In fact, I think it's great that we are a proud, gun-toting, terrorist-ass-kicking nation. But you want to know a secret? These gun-wielding terrorists target places that are known for being anti-gun. They target places of free will that are not known for unrest. This, my friends, is the problem. California is known for its anti-gun legislation. The Golden State also has a high population of recent immigrants within which a violent, anti-social minority can easily find cover. This makes the state a perfect target for attacks like these. Paris is also very well known for its anti-gun laws. All I'm saying is, you never hear of, gun hear of attacks such as these happening in countries where half of the population have an AK-47 slung over their shoulder. It's time to beef up the big guns, America. It's time for citizens to be prepared to defend themselves as a means of ensuring we won't actually have to. As always, I ask the question, are you kidding me? The Rhode Island 
Department of Transportation is broken and dysfunctional. The department always seeks more money. Is it wise to give the director the power to set the toll fees? With a change in software, he can increase the tolls, broaden and, and deepen them. An unelected bureaucrat should not have that power. Welcome back. Today we're talking with Bob Kuzak, who is a portfolio manager with Whale Rock Point Partners um, and a real expert in bonds and public finance. And um, I mean, we're talking about Providence. The picture there is just so grim. And um, our conversation makes me even more afraid, quite frankly, for Providence, but also for our state. Um, so, I mean, in summary, Providence is in trouble, right? Uh, property values are going down. Taxes are kind of at the limit that they can be. When you're the second highest corporate tax rate in the country, you're kind of at the limit. And I know that with their, uh, their population base, a lot of the folks in Providence are poor or economically stressed, let's put it that way. And they can't afford higher taxes in their rents in, in, the, in their living. So when we talk about affordable housing, to say to the town council, just raise your tax rates, that's just not an option anymore. Their, their capacity to pay higher taxes is over. It's at its limit. It's, it's at, at its limit. So, but at this point, I think, property values have been going down in Providence. Um, I, if you look at the east side, which they always kind of pluck taxes from the east side because those folks have big, beautiful homes and they're wealthy. I mean, when you're paying two, three thousand dollars a month in taxes, it kind of depresses your property values. Not a lot of people want to want to buy into that um, scenario. It can go on for a while, and, and, and property you know, values have risen. But the thing is, is that if this continues. It can be there's a point a breaking point where those property values will decline very quickly and that's a that's a very very big impact well and i saw the other day or i saw in the paper that the providence journal building is assessed at 10 million but it was only sold for three a little over three mm. and there's an argument going on between mm. the new the buyers now that hey wait this isn't worth 10 million don't charge us taxes on 10 million charge right. us taxes on three and a half um, so, so the corporate property base has been going down, and I really there's so many tax stabilization agreements out there. No one, it seems like, except the ones that have been there forever, are paying full taxes. A lot of tax breaks, but you know the the, the stress there is well documented. The the one fix would be prosperity. You know, all of a sudden, a, a lot of economic development, good high-paying jobs here you know, making all of those buildings worth even more. Yeah. Uh, all of that would be great, and that's what the elected officials are trying to do. But it, it, it's I gonna take a are. while. It's gonna take a while, even if it is successful, which it may not be. But right now you have the, the dire urgency of deficits, so they have to be dealt with. That's right, I, I honestly believe that, that Mayor Alorza is, is trying to get his hands around this and, and get that, that city pumping and prosperous again. But you have these operating deficits, the budget deficits. They just are there every year. They're not being dealt with structurally. And now you have a combative firefighters union who is, instead of coming and helping, is combative. They, they are not giving an inch. And um, I, I, don't, I don't understand their reasoning there. They, they must see the paper like you and I see. Um, well, each, each, the way it works in most municipalities is each union feels that, well, the other unions might be more highly compensated than they are. Let them sacrifice, not us. I mean, that goes on all the time. <clears throat> you know, there's only so much, the pie is only so big. So, you know, there's, there's a limit. But, but they d had to have seen Central Falls and what happened there. And I, you know, there was such... Um... After Central Falls and the dire consequences suffered by the retirees and the current employees in that, consequences. in that city. The, the uh, firefighters in Providence came to, to an agreement and gave concessions with, uh, with Mayor Tavares. And it was, in, the way I read it, only, in, only for one reason, the fear of a result of another Central Falls in Providence. <clears throat> but for some reason, over the months that have intervened, 
there's no threat now. They, apparently, there's no feeling that, well, that can happen in Providence. I think some of our elected officials at the state level are, are saying, well, we can't let that happen. Well, you know what? You, it's not up to you. It's up to the people receiving the money. Meaning well, it's up to the employees to give some concessions to get this to kind of come to some agreement so that we can avoid a Chapter 9. Uh, and, and I... Uh, I fear that with the St Fiscal Stability Act that the employees and the retirees in Providence are thinking that somehow the state's taxpayers are going to bail them out. Mm -hmm. um, that Fiscal Stability Act kind of insinuated another layer of bureaucracy um, and perhaps they think that this is going to save them and keep them whole, but but the state's taxpayers already give 50% of Providence budget. So the people in East Providence, the people in West Warwick and Coventry mm. and uh, Westerly, they are all paying 50% of the budget for Providence. Their, our state budget is already strained. Mm. We have our own structural deficits to deal with. Um, right now, thank God, there's a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a budget surplus, but in coming years, we are actually projecting structural deficits out as far as the eye can see. So the, the, the ta state's taxpayers can't and shouldn't be bailing Providence out. The, I think they have to deal with their own issues and right-size their workforce, right-size their benefits and pay. There is something about the people who get those services paying for those services. Um, and I understand that, that we all benefit from a capital city and, and, and the state's pack, taxpayers have stepped up. But at some point, we just can't, you know, there has to be some concessions. There has to be some reality imposed upon Providence. Um, I don't want it to be, I don't want it to break them. I don't want it to be so painful that these people have no lives going forward. But on the other hand, I don't understand what the end game here is that you are ratcheting up the pressure and the combativeness instead of sitting at the table and saying, let's all come together and figure out what we can do. Well, if there's not an agreement now along those lines, as you point out, the, the governor will be in charge effectively, very quickly, because she will appoint the budget commission, which will have all authority, not some, all authority. There will be no authority in the hands of Mayor Alorza and it's in the city council there. The, the, this budget commission will totally supplant, replace them, and she'll be in charge. So it'll be her problem totally and exclusively at that point. And I don't think really anybody wants that. And then if things go further Well, that beyond, because that, that takes the people out of the absolutely. process. It, it, when it, you put this yes, budget right. commission in, yep. they're not accountable to the people no. at all, to the taxpayers at all. No. The meetings of budget commissions are, are notoriously, um, uh, you know, they're disjointed from the from public comment, from, from taxpayers coming up or citizens coming up, employees coming up. No one really wants to listen to them. They're in the business of running the city without the support of the, of, uh, the voters or the residents. It's got nothing to do with them, really. It's in place of their elected officials, not alongside. And in place of the people in Providence and in place of the people in the right. state who right. are supporting Providence. So it's, it's not a good solution. And the next step after that is a receiver who is one person in charge. So that's even, even farther away from the voters. Yeah, I mean, you know, just to sum this up, we know Providence is in trouble. We hope they get their act together. We hope they figure it out. Right. Um, and we hope people come to the table and, and try to help. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. If you were guessing which nation in the world would have the third largest population in 2050, which country would you pick? Well, we know that the United States, China, and India are loaded with people. But the United Nations has now picked Nigeria for the third position, expecting a total of 339 million Nigerians by 2050, more than Americans. Today there are 182 million Nigerians, but every day another 13,000 are added to the roster. 
Now, the current birth rate is six children per woman. That is a big number when you have been reading about U.S., Japanese, and European rates at about below two. Barely sustainable birth rates. Now, what started um, me on an African history tour was a front page article in the Wall Street Journal, the November 28, 29, 2015 edition. The headline read, African baby boom brings hope and fear. It's a worthy article with lots of background on Nigeria. Now, the article zeroes in on one man specifically to get its point across. Now, that man is 93-year-old Ahmad Musa, who moved to Lakoja, Nigeria in the 1940s. Since he arrived in Lakoja and started a thriving business in nuts, he has had 21 kids from five wives. Grandkids now total 118. Wow. Wonder how he handles birthdays. But let's go back in history to find out about Nigeria. Back in the dark days uh, of colonialism, Nigeria was a part of Africa that the British colonized, which explains why the official language in Nigeria is English. And although there are 389 different ethnic groups in the country, they all speak some form of English. Now, Nigeria sits on the west coast of Africa along the Gulf of Guinea, sandwiched in between Cameroon and Benin. I looked it up with Google Earth and zipped around the country from space. Lots of land, lots of rivers, a delta to the Gulf of Guinea that looks remarkably like the Mississippi Delta. It has a bunch of oil and lots of other minerals and agricultural croplands. And the average temperature gets to a high of 84.3 to a low of 81.8. And that's all year. They don't sell snow shovels there, I would guess. Seems things have progressed nicely since the country gained its independence from Britain in 1963. Now, I was just graduating from high school then, so that's a while ago. So they became a republic like us with 36 states and 774 local governments. And they grew up, and they grew up, and they grew up, lots of them. But unlike our republic, the Nigerians are made up of Muslims at about 50% of the population, the rest being mostly Christians. So back to Mr. Musa. Five wives, you say. Well, apparently some pa one passed away, allowing him to get a replacement, so five total. How can that be? Well, if you are a Muslim and you adhere to Sharia law, you can have up to four wives. The Koran 4.3 says that a man can have up to the four wives if he can support them, that is. One, if he can. Uh, not so for women, who are allowed only one husband. And so Mr. Musa has helped to populate the country. The trouble in Nigeria is not the people, but the economy. That supports the people. The folks in Lakoja once prospered from sea trade as the town sits at the confluence of two of the largest rivers in Nigeria, the Niger River and the Benue River. Now, the Brits brought ships up to Lakoja for trade, but over time the river has mucked up enough to keep the ships away. The town's airstrip has fallen into disuse and the factories in town have closed down. So the article goes on to explain how things have gotten a bit out of hand regarding what the ever-increasing population will be able to do moving forward. The article mentions that much of the economy in Lakosia now revolves around petty trade. And you ask, what is petty trade? Now, that would be outdoor markets or salesmen stepping through traffic. And what they sell is largely for kids. Surprise, surprise. Kids clothes and cribs line the streets. A bunch of folks sell satellite TV packages so the new moms can get Nickelodeon at home for the kids. Seems that Nigerian infrastructure has worn a bit thin over time to road issues, trash issues, and the like. So the message I got was that although many countries are having trouble sustaining their populations, the African nations, specifically Nigeria, are not. It would be able to support, su su supply young and old to handle new jobs throughout the world go to universities, and otherwise take up the slack that the diminishing populations elsewhere have created. So that's good. But the article points out many of the obstacles the Nigerians will have to overcome to make it all work. I recommend you give this article a really good read. Thank you for watching, and God bless.